Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Everett, and along with my wife, Michelle Everett, welcome to day 18 of our study, Christ the Living Expression, as recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke. I trust that you have been with us each day and that you have enjoyed and received great benefit from the telling of this story. Now today, as we get into number 18, we're going to find once again that Jesus is progressing and moving toward the finality of his life here on earth. And there are major, very important lessons that he's conveying to the soon-to-be apostles at this point. And here's one of them as he tells a story and a parable about prayer. Because we know that what prayer does is that it constantly gives God access to our hearts and we have access to our Father by the Spirit. So let's begin chapter 18. One day Jesus taught the apostles to keep praying and never stop or lose hope. He shared with them this illustration. In a certain town there was a civil judge, a thick-skinned and godless man who had no fear of others' opinions. And there was a poor widow in that town who kept pleading with the judge, grant me justice and protect me against my oppressor. He ignored her pleas for quite some time, but she kept asking. Eventually, he said to himself, this widow keeps annoying me, demanding her rights, and I'm tired of listening to her. Even though I'm not a religious man and don't care about the opinions of others, I'll just get her off my back by answering her claims for justice, and I'll rule in her favor. Then she'll leave me alone. The Lord continued, did you hear what the ungodly judge said? God gives swift justice to those who don't give up. And that's the key here that Jesus is making or the, the point that he's making. So be ever praying, ever expecting, just like the widow as with the judge. Yet when the Son of Man comes back, will he find this kind of persistent faithfulness in his people. You see, as he's telling this parable in this story, it's all about remaining faithful to something that we should be given to his sons anyway. What is prayer all about? It's really about communion with the Father. And who wouldn't want to speak with their father on a daily basis? I know just with our natural children, each of us, we delight in the times that we can have maybe a phone call, a text, or some type of communication with our children. Well, the Father has given us the right and the privilege each and every day to continue our communion with him. And so Jesus says, remain faithful in this. But there's a way to do it that's proper, and there's a way to do it that's improper. And so he tells another story, and this story deals with one who believes that he is morally upright and trusted in his own virtue, and yet he looked down on everyone else with disgust. And so he said, once there were two men who went into the temple to pray. One was a proud religious leader. And we really have to watch that as we grow in God, that we do not grow in pride, but that we grow in humility. The other was a despised tax collector. The religious leader stood apart from the others and prayed, how I thank you, O God, that I'm not wicked like everyone else. That right there indicated he was wicked just like everyone else because pride and arrogance was at work in his expression. And God does not take too kindly to pride, all right? So he said, they're cheaters, swindlers, and crooks. Like that tax collector over there, I could see him just sneering and looking at him said, like that guy over there. 
I'm not that way. God, you know that I never cheat or commit adultery. I fast from food twice a week, and I give you a tenth of all I make. Every bit of that would have been great if it hadn't have had the foundation of pride. You see, if it was anchored in humility, all of those things he just mentioned, nothing wrong with any of them. It's good to tithe. It's good to fast. It's good to minister to people, share with them. All of that's good. But if we're just doing it in order that we can brag about it and just keep growing pride and being proudful, then that's when it's not good. Listen at the attitude and the heart of the tax collector. He stood off alone in the corner, away from the holy place, covered his face with his hands, feeling that he was unworthy to even look up to God. Beating his breast, he sobbed with brokenness and tears, saying, God, please, in your mercy and because of the blood sacrifice, forgive me, for I am nothing but the most miserable of all sinners. So Jesus said, which one of them left for home that day made right with God? It was the humble tax collector and not the religious leader. For everyone who praises himself will one day be humiliated before all, and everyone who humbles himself will one day be lifted up and honored before all. That's really his lesson here in this portion of the story is walk in humility. When the prophets spoke about him, they spoke about how that Christ, the living expression, would be one that would be meek and lowly. When Paul spoke of him, he said he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So that's the really the converse of pride is to walk in humility. You could say it this way. When Satan chose Lucifer to rise up in pride, the way God responded to that was as the Son of God, he lowered himself in humility. And as sons of God, living out of the life of Christ, the living expression, we can walk in humility as well, and you don't lose anything. Well, Jesus went on further and showed them how to deal with children. Because, you know, the apostles, they didn't think a great man like Jesus had time for children. And so the children, the parents would bring the children to him to bless them. And the apostles said, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. He doesn't have time for that. The master doesn't have time for that. He said, no, I want to teach you something. Bring the children, parents, children, and you trainees. Come here. I'm going to teach you something. And he took the children, and he said, never hinder a child from coming to me. Let them all come, for God's kingdom realm belongs to them as much as it does anyone else. They demonstrate to you what faith is all about. Learn this well. Unless you receive the revelation of the kingdom realm the same way a little child receives it, you will never be able to enter in. And so he took the children. What we're talking about there is meaningful touch. And that's extremely important for all of us is to experience meaningful touch in life. And then he spoke words over them because you can't bless if you don't say something. But they must be words of value, to speak to their value. And then the third thing is be there. Be there as a supportive measure. After you've spoken the word, be there to encourage. Be there to exhort. Be there to build up. Because the word, if it's the word of the Lord, will never return back to the Father unfulfilled. And so Jesus said, 
I want you to remember this. Receive the kingdom just like a child. You see, a child isn't sitting there trying to figure out what his motive is. A child is completely wide open, pure, receiving what was being given at that moment. Well, he concludes chapter 18 by telling the story of a rich young ruler. And he came to him and he said, what do I need to do in order to receive the kingdom realm? And Jesus asked him a question here. Well, what are you doing already? Because remember now, Jesus came at the end of the law age. So if they're in compliance, it would be with the things that the law has stated. He said, you already know what is right and what the commandments teach. He said, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, and respectfully honor your father and your mother. Now, if you notice something, all of these are how you relate to your fellow brothers and sisters and your fellow neighbors. This is how you relate to mankind. This one Jesus left out on purpose because he knew that was the crux of the issue with this young man. And that was, yet not to covet anything. When the young man said, oh, I've been doing these for as long as I can remember. And that's when Jesus hit him with the one that mattered the most. And when he did, he said, okay, you're very wealthy. Go and sell everything and then take the proceeds and distribute them among the poor. And then come and follow me and you have wealth in the eternal realm. And he walked away from that. And some translations says that he was sad. There are others that said his face showed great anger, that he was challenged with the very thing that he held dear. But if he wanted to experience the eternal realm and follow Jesus, that was the very thing that mattered the most to him that he had to release. And at that moment, when he walked away, Jesus said, it is next impossible for those who have everything to enter into God's kingdom realm. And when Peter heard that, he said, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. Houses, our careers. Jesus said, when you left everything, you haven't actually left everything. Because this is what happens. Listen to my words. Anyone who leaves his home behind and chooses God's kingdom realm over wife, children, parents, and family, it will come back to him many more times in this lifetime. Now, I'll tell you something. I'm counting on that word. And in the age to come, he will inherit even more than that. He will inherit eternal life. And from there, Jesus had the discussion with them about his death and his resurrection. They had no idea what he was talking about. Because it says here, the disciples didn't have a clue what he was saying, for his words were a mystery that was hidden from them. And so, you know, as you go through each of these final chapters leading up to chapter 24, we're getting closer and closer to the fact that the ultimate price is going to be paid in order that Christ, the living expression, the seed given by God, can release this life that it can work in a many-membered body. And so when you have those like the blind man in Jericho crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he stops. He says, Bring him over here. What do you want? He said, I want to see again. He said, all right, you can see again. And he praised God joyously. You see, that's why 
this life is so important to us. That's why Christmas is so important to us, because it opened back up to us the rim of God to release the life of God to all the hurting and broken that they can experience the richness of this that we call Christ, the living expression. Well, we'll be back tomorrow and read chapter 19 because it's getting, as some of the people in my community would say, gooder and gooder, but we know it's good. So we'll see you tomorrow.